of people in pubs saying, yeah, you can take yeah. it, you know. Oh, okay. And then taking it all back. Oh. So, if you know, 50 cents yeah. has been transferred. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. Well, it's legit. Well, no, then. You learn something every day. Yeah. Not that I trade horses. Yeah, there used to be a, a trick that people used to get around the taxes when they gave mm -hmm. cars as gifts is that they would, instead of giving the gift and paying full price on the tax, they would sell it to for a dollar and pay a dollar. Oh, I see. Yeah. Texas has gotten rid of that. I don't know about the other 49 states. But. I'm rolling. You're rolling? All right. Uh, so uh, uh, we're ready to begin. Uh, your name is? My name is Peter Dunn. I'm the leader of the United Future Party and a member of the New Zealand Parliament. Uh, so keeping in mind that this film is being made for uh, an American audience who does not know what United Future is, uh, could you briefly explain what it is and uh, what its policies are? The United Future is what we would describe as a centre party. We're in the middle of the political spectrum. We tend to support open market economic policies and more expansive uh, social policies. So a combination, if you like, the right when it comes to economic policies and the left when it comes to social policy. Okay. Um, how, how does this differ from, say, Labour or National? Well, the, the National Party in New Zealand is the traditional Conservative Party. The Labour Party would be the traditional progressive or left-wing party. Uh, we draw from elements of both, and we say that there, one side's pretty good at managing the checkbook and the other's pretty good at managing uh, the social agenda, but neither have got the full picture. Uh, and I did notice that uh, your uh, logo colours, they're, they're purple, right? Well, it's an amalgam of uh, red and blue, actually, which are the colours of the two major parties. Okay. Um, how much influence do third parties have in MMP? It depends on the nature of the third party and the nature of uh, their involvement. Um, this party, for instance, over the 12 years we've had MMP, has supported governments led by the National Party and governments led by the Labour Party. In fact, uh, we've been involved in some form of government arrangement for nine of the last 12 years. So we've been able to influence a fair measure of the policy agenda and get a fair number of our policies achieved, even though we've been quite a small party at times. Uh, what policies have you gotten achieved? Uh, this year, I, I happen to be the Minister of Revenue in the New Zealand Government, and this year I oversaw the first major changes to business taxes and the biggest business tax reduction in over 20 years. Uh, that was a core policy of ours. It's worth billions of dollars. It's very um, positive for the economy. We've had a National Commission for Families established in earlier years. We've been able to get a number of other major policies of ours um, put in place through having a working agreement with the government of the day. I understand you were also involved with something called KiwiSaver? Well, I'm, I happen to be the minister responsible for KiwiSaver, although it's fair to say that that was an idea that came from the Labour Party. KiwiSaver is our national savings scheme. Um, we've certainly been very supportive of it and we've sought to broaden its base and now we have uh, well over 300,000 New Zealanders signed up to it and that's a very positive step forward. Uh, but that's voluntary, correct? It's a voluntary savings scheme. My own view is that in time, as the numbers of people involved increase, it would be logical to make it a compulsory savings scheme simply because it's much easier to administer at that point of view. But we're a long way off that happening. Um, how would you compare smaller parties in the New Zealand Parliament to lobby groups in the USA? Well, again, it depends on your size and the, and the if you like, the, how vocal you are in per pursuing your arguments. In the New Zealand Parliament, which is only 121 members, uh, small parties can clearly have an influence, given that neither of the major parties secures a majority. So to form a government, you need to build a majority alliance, and that's where the small parties can have their influence. And uh, traditionally, parties that are around the middle of the political spectrum are more likely to be influential with either side than parties that are at the extreme ends of it. So, um, w would you say that uh, that third party influence is uh, proportionate to the numbers of uh, votes they get? Uh, it's probably, if anything, a little more than that. Uh, uh, under our MMP system, the seats you get in Parliament are proportionate to the number of votes you obtain. But because of the nature of the negotiations between parties, to get the smaller parties on side, the third parties on side, major parties in government are likely to concede a little bit more than they might otherwise um, be forced to concede. So, if anything, you could argue positively or negatively that the smaller parties have a disproportionate influence. But we would say, given 
the example I gave before of something like a business tax cut. Uh, the fact that also this year we've made all donations to charities fully tax deductible. Uh, we would say that they're actually major positive beneficial achievements and therefore if we've got a little bit more influence than our numbers justify, we think that's a positive thing too. Okay. Um, w would it be fair to say that uh, United Future is socially conservative? No, this, this is um, an argument that's been promoted in the past when we, we had a an element of what can only be described as religious fundamentalists who are now no longer with us, thankfully, who were pursuing a, a, a very conservative uh, social agenda. We've tended to take a much more socially pragmatic view. Um, we, we've, we focus a lot on families, but we're less focused on the definition of a family because that, that will differ from circumstance to circumstance. We're much more focused on the function of a family. A family unit, uh, however it is defined, is for all of us the critical nurturing and developmental unit, and right through the course of history that's been the case. So we think that where families are strong and function well, society follows. But as I say, we're less interested in defining the family than we are than saying the institution that we all know and recognise works and is able to keep on working. Um, it, it does have, as you mentioned, you do have some uh, history with the, the Christian Democratic Party and uh, hmm. uh, could you go a little bit into that? Well essentially what happened in the late 1990s was the United Party as it then was, uh, of which I was leader, and the future New Zealand Party, which was a more moderate uh, Christian party. Uh, discovered that we actually had a lot in common from a policy perspective, even though we didn't, United didn't have the religious perspective. And uh, we thought it was logical to combine, frankly, and um, work together in, in, in for the common good. And that's when United Future, which was an amalgamation of the two names, was born. What happened subsequently was that one or two uh, in that more moderate Christian group suddenly, if you like, shed their disguises and we discovered we had a very right-wing, moralistic uh, crew who were uh, intent on taking us back to the Stone Age. And we suffered a lot from that because United had the image of being a progressive, liberal uh, centre party. Uh, and suddenly we were lumped in with people who were seen to be anything but. So we've had a, we've had a, a, a if you like, a sorting out this year, uh, which will allow United Future to reposition itself as a genuine, moderate centre party, as I say, committed to New Zealand families, committed to strengthening communities because communities are the core of society and committed to playing a positive role in the future. Now you're talking about Gordon Copeland, right? Uh, I'm talking about him and one or two others in particular, yes. Okay. Um, could you explain, uh, and you may have a very, you know, uh, a very specific view on this, but um, it, Gordon Copeland was elected as a list member for United mm -hmm. Future. He then left United Future. He does not hold an electorate mm. seat. My facts are correct on that's this? That's absolutely point? correct. So why does uh, Gordon Copeland retain his seat when he was elected as a list member of a party that he no longer belongs well, to? Well, that, that's one of the great anomalies in our system. Uh, I can go one step further. Under our system, you get representation in Parliament by winning either 5% of the party vote on a national basis, or if you win less than 5%, winning a constituency seat in which case whatever your actual percentage is counts. We happened, in at this election, we dropped below 5%, but, but I won a constituency seat. And as a result of that, we were entitled to three members of parliament. One of those was Gordon Copeland. Now, he argues that he was elected by the people of New Zealand. In fact, he was elected because the people of my constituency put their confidence and trust in me as their local member of parliament. So we say that uh, he has no moral or legal authority to remain in Parliament. We think it's ironic that he's out there now professing to lead a morals-based party when he has no moral integrity or right to be in this place. But it's an anomaly of our system and we think probably in due course the voters will sort that out. Um, are you worried that, uh, well, what's the biggest problem for United Future arising from Copeland splitting the party as it were? Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, glorify what he did by splitting the party. Uh, in fact, uh, for every member that left with him, three more have joined us, so we, we've done pretty well out of the deal. I think the biggest problem is the perception of disunity. I think the biggest problem is that he has taken with him some good people, uh, and it's the question of rebuilding um, 
the trust and the loyalty of people who've supported us previously. But, but on the bigger picture, I've been amazed by the number of people that have said, thank God, now those people have gone, we can support you. And that's something obviously we want to capitalise on between now and the election due next year and just see what result that produces. Uh, are you worried that, um, uh, that the uh, Copeland's new party will split the, uh, the vote that you'd normally get? Or? No, I'm not. Uh, I think that, that if you look at the last election, there's a very small market for that extreme right-wing moralist vote. And at the last count, there's about three parties chasing it. So um, I'm not worried about them splitting our vote. I'm certainly delighted at the fact that they'll split up an infinitesimal share of the vote between them, and none of them will go anywhere. Okay. Um, let's see. In America, social conservatism is widely seen as tied to economic conservatism. And is that true in New Zealand? I think that's probably true, although there is this peculiar phenomenon here of working class males in particular, uh, and certainly um, those perhaps in the 40 plus bracket tend to be very socially conservative, even though they would go out and vote unthinkingly for the Labour Party because of their social economic, socioeconomic status. But I think the phenomenon that started to develop in New Zealand in the last decade, uh, which in my sense is a little more worrying, is very affluent uh, people who have a very conservative um, social agenda based on fundamentalist um, Christian values. And I think that, as we've seen obviously in the United States, we're starting to see the same thing develop here. And some of the um, moves we've just been talking about are a byproduct of that. Uh, and I, I think that's probably a big issue for New Zealand in the future. It's not going to be a huge political issue, but I think we're starting to see those groups becoming more active. And they're, because of their social agenda, there is the potential for more social division to emerge. Groups like the Exclusive Brethren? Well, the Exclusive Brethren are something else altogether. Um, they're a group that professes no interest in politics. They don't allow their members to vote, and yet they seek to influence the election outcomes. That's a wee bit bizarre. But I'm thinking more of groups like the Destiny Church and some of its satellites who are built around charismatic individuals with a very uh, narrow view of the world but have this um, sense that nothing can stop them. Uh, and, and big money behind them. I don't mean in a, that they're going to use that for political lobbying, but they are affluent, successful people who are seeking to um, now extend their influence into the political arena. And I think that's going to be an issue that we're just going to have to keep an eye on over the next few years. Um, when people vote in uh, a mixed member proportional mm -hmm. election, are they voting more for the people in the party or the policies of the party? It's a combination of both because they have two votes. Uh, what tends to happen is that local members of parliament who are half pie good will get re-elected with the electorate vote because oh, I can vote for you because you're okay. But the real choice is then with the party vote, which because the party vote determines the overall numbers and that's when people look at policies and they look at performance and they start to look also at compatibilities. Well, if we vote for you, who can you work with after the election? Or are we just simply voting um, for a waste of space? So. It's, it's, there are two dimensions to this, and um, as I say, good local members, regardless of party, tend to get re-elected. Uh, the competition is for the party vote. In my electorate, for example, I get a very strong majority of local support, but the party vote is a contest between Labour and National. My party comes third or fourth in that contest, but people can take the view, oh, we can vote for you, Peter but we're going to give our party vote to someone else. Now, from our point of view, that just happens to suit us in that electorate, but it's not always the case. Um, how would you compare popular skepticism in the political process uh, in the 1980s under first-past-the-post compared to today under NMD? That's an interesting point. In the 1980s uh, and early 90s, you had this peculiar phenomenon of uh, governments being elected on the basis of either one set of policies or one perceived set of policies and then saying the situation we've inherited is far more serious than we imagined, so we're forgetting all of that, we're heading off in an entirely different direction. That happened in 1984, the Labour Party elected uh, on the basis of what people probably saw as a moderate centre-left policy, uh, ended up outdoing Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in terms of centre-right policies. The National Party in 1990 came along and said, look, we will um, we will um, turn back this process, but actually then decided no, the, the way forward was to accelerate it. 
people felt very frustrated because it was only a two-party system, Tweedledum or Tweedledee, and if you changed, it didn't seem to make any difference. The direction was set. That's what drove the contest for an alternative system like MMP. Do people feel less disillusioned? That's an interesting question. I think that what people thought we were going to get was a kinder, gentler form of politics. Uh, in fact, it hasn't happened. Uh, MMP is an electoral system. It's not about political style. It's about the process that people get to, s to sit in the House of Representatives as a result of. And I think there's a measure of frustration that because uh, we've changed the electoral system, it's still politics as usual. Different names, different faces, but essentially it's still politics as usual. And I think there's a bit of a head of steam building up, not of 1980s frustrations, but of just sort of where do we, the public, fit into this? And that will be an interesting development to watch over the next little while. We hear talk of people wanting binding referenda on various issues, for instance. Um, whether that proceeds, I think, is a, is a matter for debate. But there's just the sense of people feeling a wee bit disconnected. Um, about this disconnect, do you think that MMP has reached people who wouldn't normally be politically active uh, into participating in the politi political process? In some senses it has, uh, because the uh, development of new parties uh, has allowed that. Um, what used to be the case in the, in the 80s and 90s and earlier was that the two main parties, National and Labour, tended to be very broad church. Um, they tended to just simply overlap each other from time to time. And so you could have had, in the Labour Party in the 1980s, the extreme right and the extreme left coalescing quite nicely, and similarly in the National Party. What MMP has done has made, if you like, the prejudices more explicit, so you tend to form a party around a view rather than try and find a home in a major party. In that sense, it's encouraged a lot of people to participate who might never have thought of participating before. But the challenge for the smaller parties is keeping people motivated because it's a long, hard road and people will only bash their head against a wall for so long before deciding we're going to do something else. Um, do you think MMP has made politicians more accountable? Yes, it has, uh, for the reason I just described. But you are much more accountable in the first instance to your own party because parties are more focused in terms of a particular policy mix. I think you're also more accountable to the public because you live or die by the party vote. And certainly at the, at the local level, as a local representative, I think you are more accountable in that people expect you to be able to attend, regardless of politics, to their local needs. Uh, you'll never be fully accountable in the sense that people want. This is the, the, the sort of the, the notion of the perfect Greek democracy will never be repeated. But I think in New Zealand, uh, we have as accountable a system as we've ever had, and in certain areas it's more so than it was previously. And um, how, uh, you mentioned that uh, politics, it's been politics as usual. Has there been any change in campaigning tactics? Oh, a, lot, a lot of change. Uh, previously in New Zealand, elections used to concentrate on what was known as the marginal electorates, the swing seats. And if you were in a seat that was seen as a safe seat, then basically no attention was paid to that because it didn't really matter what the nature of the campaign was, party A or party B was going to win that. And voters in those safe seats often felt neglected. You know, I could vote, my party could put up a dog as a candidate and it would still win. Um, people in the marginal seats, on the other hand, felt totally overindulged because they got promised everything in return for their loyalty. Now, because the electorate is around party votes, a party vote in a safe seat is worth exactly the same as a party vote in a marginal seat. So the campaigns tend to become more universal. They're not just focused on those dozen or so seats that are going to swing the election. And in fact, what we're seeing is the notion of marginal seats is less significant now than it used to be. It's really that party vote that counts. And as I say, a party vote in a true blue electorate or a bright red electorate counts as much as a party vote anywhere else. And that's certainly changed the nature of campaigning. It's tended to become much more nationwide, much more universal, but much less specifically focused. The messages are much more simple. Vote for us because we will do X, Y, and Z, rather than if I'm your local representative, then I promise to attend to the school problem or that transport problem or, or whatever. Um, how has uh, MMP affected the lives of New Zealanders who don't really explicitly follow politics or current events? I'm not sure that it has affected them in, in, to that extent in any great regard. Um, next year, for instance, uh, at the election, the majority of people voting will have only ever voted under MMP. So I think that 
for them that will be the only system they know. Uh, and some will, will like it. Polls show about a 50-50 split at the moment. Some hanker for something different, but it's not clear what something different is. Um, I think that one of the risks of MMP when it was first introduced was that it was oversold. As I said earlier, it was only ever an electoral system. It was only a mechanism. But it was imbued by some with a sense of almost sort of much greater significance that this was going to bring sweetness and light and all sorts of things to politics, which it would never do. That's over to the individuals within the system. So I suppose this system is, is, is regarded probably about as well or as poorly as its predecessor. And um, with the benefit of hindsight, do you think that the transition to MMP would have happened in the same way uh, again if, uh, if, the, uh, if, say, it hadn't happened in 1993, uh, 1992 and 1993, say it had happened three years prior or three years later? I, I don't think we would have made a change had there not been the sense of deep disillusionment to which we referred earlier. The fact that people in 1984 had voted for a government that they thought was going to head in one direction, only to find it head in a different direction, and then six years later threw it out for a government that simply said, well, we disagree with that. The problem is they haven't gone fast enough. I think that that sense that whatever you do, nothing seems to change is really what provoked um, the MMP uh, revolution, if you like. Had there not been that sense of deep unease, I think people would have said, oh, well, it's only just a political system. It doesn't really affect us that greatly. Why bother changing it? And uh, how would you change the MMP system, uh, if you could? Well, I think one change that does need to be made is the one we alluded to earlier, where list MPs leave parties. They should be required to forfeit their seat in Parliament. I think it's a different matter for a, a, someone who's directly elected in a constituency, because you've at least got that group that you can say, they voted for me. But someone like a Gordon Copeland, for instance, who comes in purely on a party ticket, has no moral legitimacy at that point. And I think a lot of people say, hang on, you know, where does he fit? Or where do people like him fit in the system? We didn't vote for them. We voted for your party or some other party. How come you now lose representation as a result of their actions? So I think that's one change. I think one of the other changes, too, we do need to look at in New Zealand, or the two others I'd look at. One would be our three-year term of parliament. It comes around very quickly. The argument has always been it's too long for a bad government and too short for a good government, but we should perhaps look at increasing that to four years. And also I think we should look at whether to bring more certainty into the system we should have a fixed election date. At the moment we don't, it's largely, we know what the latest date the election could be held by is, but the Prime Minister determines when's the most suitable time politically for an election. I think a fixed election date would be beneficial and it would also remove some of the uncertainty about whether governments can last. Governments would be forced to last the distance and forced to compromise to make up the numbers uh, if things were getting difficult. Um, Fifteen years on, I know that it's 14 years, but this will take a year to edit. Mm. So 15 years on, do you think uh, MMP is uh, working as a governmental system or an electoral system rather? I don't think we'll change from MMP. Uh, it wasn't my preferred option. I preferred a system known as the single transferable vote because that had the benefit of everyone having to be directly elected on, on a proportional scale. Uh, but I think in terms of engaging more political opinion, I think in terms of giving opportunities for political representation that weren't there previously, MMP has achieved its goal. Where I think the jury is still out is, is the system understood sufficiently by people? Uh, this is a very collaborative system, and I think a number of people still have the view, well, I can vote for one party over here with one of my votes and one party over there with the other one, and that's actually nice and fair. What they don't realise is that they've essentially cancelled themselves out. So I'm just not sure whether the strategic appreciation is there to quite the extent that people hoped. But I think as each election goes by, more and more people become used to the system and it's very difficult to change. After all, we had our old first-past-the-post system for about 140 years. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you'd be willing to answer this today, but um, it, when the 2008 election rolls around, uh, who would you rather be in coalition with? Well, we take the view that the voters make the choice on election day who they, which party they prefer to see leading the government, and we then see what policy compatibility uh, we have 
with that party. As I said earlier, we've worked with National in the past, we've worked with Labour for the past two terms. Were there to be a change of government at the next election, as at this stage seems very likely, we would be comfortable if we were able to conclude a satisfactory agreement working with a National-led government. We'd be equally comfortable in similar circumstances working with a Labour-led government. All right. Uh, anything that you had, Helen? <coughs> Yes, I'd like to ask a few questions, sure. if that's right, and yep. you know, direct your, question, your answers to Brian. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that MMP was chosen over the single transferable vote system? Uh, that was the option that was put forward by the Royal Commission as its preferred option. I think it was because it was seen as a compromise between having uh, elements of first-past-the-post and a proportional system. Uh, I was responsible for getting the STV system even into the referendum process. It wasn't featured originally and it, it didn't get nearly the um, support that it needed resource-wise, but it still ran a, a, a good second. And I think with a fairer deal in retrospect in terms of its promotion and more time, it would have probably preferred to be uh, emerged as the top option. Single transferable vote, that's the system that they use in Ireland, That's correct? right, yes, yes. Yeah. So you have multi-member constituencies and you rank the candidates from one to whatever, and then the bottom rate bottom ranked one drops off and you keep on doing that until you get a majority. Okay. Um, and you referred to tax cuts for business recently, was there any sort of resistance to that from the left? Well the interesting thing was at the last election the only party that campaigned against any form of tax reductions was the Labour Party and so I was quite pleased um, after the election to be in a position to negotiate with them a deal where they had to agree to a business tax reform package. And once that got underway and, and we started to do the work on it and look at the numbers and put the package together, uh, there was no resistance from the Labour Party. In fact, they now go out there and, and laud the fact that they have presided over this big business tax cut um, for the first time in two decades. The irony is that the National Party, for reasons which are bizarre, voted against it. So Labour beats Labor, National over the head with, here's the party of business, and yet they vote against a business tax cut. Uh, we just sit there smugly and think, well, actually, if it wasn't for us, there wouldn't be any of this fuss because you wouldn't be doing it. Mm. And um, the 5% threshold, what, what do you think? What's your opinion of the 5% threshold? Well, the, select, the, um, the Royal Commission that recommended the MMP system originally recommended a smaller threshold. I think it was 4% from memory. Uh, I've got mixed views. 5% is a very big hurdle. Uh, it's... it's uh, it sounds easy to say just 5% of the vote, but that's actually a very big hurdle for small parties to cross. So the good thing about it is it excludes a lot of fringe or, uh, if you might say, sort of riffraff parties. On the other hand, it's probably too high a hurdle. Um, I know some countries, I think Israel, for instance, has no threshold. Uh, I think that's too low, that, that, that's, that's not realistic. I think probably 4% would be a more realistic threshold Will it change? I doubt it. I think people, particularly in the major parties, are comfortable with 5%. Some say even 5% is too low um, because it makes it too easy for smaller parties to get represented. I think that sort of misses the point about the electoral system, actually. Um, it seems to me to be a bit crazy to have potentially 5% of the electorate with no voice. And that's effectively what you're saying if you say we want that threshold to be higher. So on balance, I'd probably move it down to 4%, but I wouldn't want to go much lower than that. Okay. Uh, this is my last question. Um, with, I mean, the example of Gordon Copeland leaving the party and staying in Parliament, do you think that when, when MNP was sort of designed and set up, was that an o mere oversight or was that intended? I think it was an oversight. I, 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 what happened, um, the background was that we came out of a period of very long political stability where people didn't leave parties. Um, that was unheard of. Uh, in the Parliament between 1993 and 1996, which was the transitional one, there was quite a significant number of party movement. And that was accepted at the time as being part of the transition to MMP and people positioning with new parties, etc. No one really believed that once MMP was put in place, um, that that trend would continue. In fact, the Labour Party in 1999 passed a law banning party hopping altogether by list or constituency MPs. But even they said, we'll put this law in place for only six years, because after that this will be a non-issue. Um, the interesting thing is that it lapsed in 2005, and since that time we've had two. 
cases, Mr Copeland and Mr Field. Um, but again, they would be seen as exceptions rather than the norm, and the expectation would be that both of them will fall by the wayside in due course and things will carry on. Whether that leads to people wanting to reconsider whether you have some form of um, control is another question, but at this stage that seems unlikely. Uh, that's your last question. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to add that we didn't cover? Or? I don't think so. Do you think, Ted? I think I've covered. We've, 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 lot, we've covered all of the stuff, really. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, do you mind if we just get some cut? No, away? that's fine. Thanks. Thank no. you for that. Okay. Once again, thank you. Thank you. So, do you, what do you, do you need me? Uh, I don't think so. Not for the cutaways, okay. unless you want to explain some of the uh, some of your treasured moments. Keep the microphone on and. Um, that out of the way, shall I? Um, this one I'm quite proud of. I was presented by this by the uh, Mormon Church in Salt Lake City. I'm proud for two reasons. One, that it survived the journey home, but the other one is that it's really just a nice um, depiction of a family environment, and um, I think it's quite a neat piece of work. Um, what else I've got here? I'll probably recognize. The British audience would recognise that uh, famous um, front door. It's number 10 Downing Street. Um, when I was visited there at one stage. Um, uh, when was that? That was in 1996. I was also I was Minister of Revenue also at that time, and I was calling on people in the Prime Minister's think tank. So I persuaded someone to take a photograph as I knocked on the front door. And over on the wall over here, I've got. Um, a face that the American um, viewers will will recognise. This gentleman here. Uh -huh. okay. so that was when he visited New Zealand in 1999. And, um, we had the privilege of meeting him at a dinner. Uh, do you want to move the tripod up? No, because it gets too much glare otherwise. Okay. Cool. Okay. okay. Um, I see you have a bunch of, um, oh. you know. A rose gallery of cartoons. Hmm. I won't explain them because they're all very specific. But, mm. but, but, but it, you know. It's quite nice to collect some of these. Well, they're not all 100% uh, uh, complimentary. I mean, you. you oh, know. no, I don't. In, in fact, um, I, I quite like good cartoons. Um, if I think they, they may not be complimentary, but if they're fair. Um, and, uh, yeah. Some of those are some of those are ones I have a laugh at even still. All right, uh, I think we're ready to go. Or yeah, I'll just quickly get a shot of this New Zealand flag. Okay. And the, the view from uh, it might it be possible to get a view out the window sure. at the Parliament building? I think this is the closest we're going to get to it without get, renting a helicopter. Yeah. And then we get. A view. Sorry. Do you want to pull the blinds up? That'd be great. <coughs> On the ninth floor up there, where the railed, um, the, the, the railing is, that's the Prime Minister's office. So oh. I, I can, I'm not sure what, so I think she actually looks out the other side of the building, but I can keep a rough eye on what she's up to. <laughs> We've been trying to get an interview uh, with her, but uh, obviously very busy, yeah, and it's yeah. right near the holidays. Yeah. So. She's been away, um, yeah. but I think she's back in the country now. Is she? I think so. Oh, she is. Yeah. She's already this morning. Oh, that's right. I forgot to listen to that. So. What radio station was that? Oh, ZB. ZB. Oh, yeah. And she's also on Breakfast TV on a Monday morning, too, I think. Yeah. I listen to her on BFM, which is student.